I challenged them to, uh, to start becoming leaders. That's one of the problems we have is they're not stepping up and becoming leaders. Uh, I've developed three lessons that take someone from, from the beginning to the end. If they go through these lessons, they know what, uh, what they need to do to become a Christian. And I, I had them translated into the Romanian language and I challenged them to start teaching. Of course, I taught, this is what I taught uh, while I was there. And I had two volunteers that volun of the men, that actually three because of, uh, one of the other churches, uh, a man volunteered. But uh, to go ahead and start teaching um, these lessons after I left, uh, I was only able to do usually the first lesson. But... Uh, the next day on Monday, uh, well, on Sunday we had the uh, Bible study there at Cryova and then the worship service and, and had a good uh, group there. We went on to uh, Leo Stancha Louis. Uh, it was uh, out in one of the villages, and it's a, uh, really a strong congregation. Uh, it's got some, some help there. The guy that you see... Uh, in the white T-shirt on the front row there, is uh, his name is Marinell, and he's the leader of that church. And his son, Addie, was my driver and interpreter most of the time while I was while I was there in Romania. But uh, we had a, of course, good services there at uh, at that church. And then after the the service there. This couple came up to me, and they were they were concerned. They wanted to to uh, ask some questions, and so through an interpreter, of course, I I asked them, you know, what what the problem was, and they wanted to know. Uh, they were Christians, and they wanted to know if they should stop making moonshine. That was uh, I was kind of shocked by the question. But later I learned that a lot of the people in the village, there's a certain tree that grows there and they make moonshine from the fruit of that tree. And uh, it's real common and they sell it. And uh, so, you know, I, I told them, yes, they needed to stop making moonshine. And, and uh, they said, well, can we sell what we have made? Or... or <laughs> Or should we pour it out? And I told them, no, it'd be better to pour it out. And I said, do your neighbors know you make it? And they said, yes. I said, well, then invite your neighbors to watch you pour it out so that they know that you no longer do that. And uh, so they left and they, with the intention of doing that. But uh, let's see, I'm going the wrong direction. The, uh, we had studies in that village, uh, lots of studies. Uh, if, you, if you look at the uh, first study we had is, on the, is the upper slide up there, uh, the upper picture. And uh, they were, it, it told me that I didn't have everything right on the study. You see, I didn't realize that their Bible, while it has the same meaning, does not read the same as our Bible. And so it, while I was doing the fill in the blank questions that we use, uh, similar to the back to the Bible that we're using here, the answers didn't, weren't automatic. And of course, we had stu problems with them understanding what the verse was saying and that sort of thing. And, and the very first question is, uh, is, has to do with Jesus' prayer, uh, and John 17, and, and he's praying to God, and he says, your word is truth. And so the very first question was, uh, what is truth? And uh, more than once, I got the, the answer, not lying. <laughs> so, so we had to go back, and we had to you know, explain what's happening, and, and go through it, and, and finally it dawned on them. And this, this repeated. Uh, it was it would go on to about the third question and all of a sudden they understood that the answer is right there. It's in that verse. 
And uh, so, it, you know, it got easier uh, until we got to the to the young lady that that you see in that in that slide right I can get this to work this lady right here she's deaf she's mute she can't read or write and she's not too good at signing now, the, the other young lady that you see is is named Juana and she's one of the interpreters and she's also signs. Well, her husband is also deaf. And uh, so it, it became a real challenge to try to teach these people. Uh, Juana could, could sign to the husband and he could understand it, but the wife could not understand the sign language. But he, the husband could sign to her and help her Till she understood it and so a very difficult difficult study but we got through the study and and uh, and I'll be going back uh, to try to study with her again if, if the Lord lets me go back in in September but it's uh some of the studies were easy some of the people are very smart but this one was a very very difficult study as I Went on through all the studies. Uh, you might notice this group on the top row there is uh, a family. You see, we're sitting on the beds. See, they don't have living rooms. Most of the time, they, they'll have one or two rooms in their home, and, and there'll be a circle of beds. It's a U-shape of beds. And, and they sleep. The whole family sleeps in that room, and they... Uh, and, and they, that's where their, their living room is, is sitting on the beds. And so we sit on the beds and we study. Uh, the little lady that you see to the left, she reads her Bible every day. She's 94 years old. And that little wooden thing that you see in front of her, that's her walker. She uses it, it's a homemade walker that she uses to get around. Uh, the picture's... Down at the bottom was a, a house that, that they had a little bit more. Uh, that's a kitchen on the right-hand side. They had a kitchen that, that went the width of the house there. It's a little narrow room. And uh, then they had a bedroom, and, a, and they actually had another small room. But that's unusual. Um, here we're studying. You see we're sitting on the beds, and we're studying with... Uh, Addie's brother's named Mihai, and Mihai is about to uh, marry the the woman's daughter. Now, the daughter that he's marrying is not in this picture. The uh, she's got other daughters there, but you see one, me and Juana having a study. Now, I call your attention to the little child there. It's uh, it's about eighty degrees, and probably hotter than that in the house. And uh, you see the child has on the bargain. They, they wrap their children up and keep them, even in the summertime, they wear boggins. They're afraid they're going to catch something. And uh, that's real common. They don't use air conditioning. Not, you know, that's a unheard of. And uh, Joanne was mentioning that earlier about how hard it was over there to work because it's so hot. You're always hot. Uh, went on on Monday to uh, on Tuesday to Cheriosh, uh, another village there, and we we studied. Uh, this this man is a Christian, uh, but his wife wasn't, and we were studying with her and, and him both. Uh, did lots of lessons in, in, in uh, Cheriosh. This is Marion Dobry. He's the leader there at Cheriosh. He's crippled. Uh, when I went 21 years ago, one of the studies I did was in the village of Cheriosh, and uh, I had to walk through mud to get to this man's house. Uh, he was in bed, uh, crippled. Uh, his wife could walk. Of course, they had a dirt floor. Chickens were running in and out of the house. But uh, 
he's the one he's the uh, one that started the church in Cherioch and, and uh, him handicapped like he is later his wife lost a leg and uh, we helped her with a prosthesis uh, to so both of them are handicapped but they're faithful workers in the church uh, we did lots of studies there you'll see the studying with a couple here the picture's a little bit dark there but a uh, couple were right in front of me is who we're studying with the guy that's sitting over to the side is the taxi driver we hired a taxi to bring these people to the church so they could study and the taxi driver wanted to sit through the study so people are interested in Romania there, there's a always an interest uh, this is a village whale that's right there in front of the church uh, all the people in the village they don't have running water they don't have septic tanks even they have a, uh, outhouses and they go to the well to get their water uh, you know rain shine 10 inches of snow like we had when we were there in a year ago uh, they have to go to the wells to get their water uh, traveling back we, we I went back on Wednesday to uh, Patesh but we it took a while we have things like the sheep in the middle of the road and you'll see the sheep dog there uh, it's not unusual to see the storks nest on the on top of the poles that's a common sight uh, the uh, top picture top left is in the village of Budessa and uh, we don't have a church in that village but I went out and studied with these people uh, there's Two of the ladies are there are Christians, but they have a two-room house there you can see behind us. Uh, there's six adults and seven children live in those two rooms. It's uh, one of the poorest areas, poorest villages uh, around. And you can see on the, on the right-hand side, we're about to go inside, inside the house to study. But it's just... Uh, they, they just don't have anything. I mean, they're really poor. We did lots of studies in, in, uh, at the church buildings. We did studies in Patesh. Uh, one of the studies that we had in, in uh, Bucha ended up with a baptism. Uh, his name is Titi. And uh, he was baptized. Uh, then on Saturday, well, on Friday night, we had the uh, we had men's meeting in uh, Patesh. And we had, of course, the other three churches in that area. Uh, I say in that area, they're, you know, an hour, hour and a half away. But, but uh, we, we paid taxis to bring them in. And uh, transportation's kind of tough over there because the gas is... Is almost six dollars a gallon and so you know it's it's expensive that was one of the biggest cost while I was over there is the cost of the, the transportation but we brought them in and, and had a good men's meeting there again I, I introduced those lessons and let got them to, to start studying start teaching with other people uh, and then Sunday, uh, of course, we uh, taught the Bible study and and, and uh, preached at Patesh. And you'll see the young lady sitting to my right. She's sitting down. She's signing. We have uh, several deaf members there. And uh, she's signing. Addie's interpreting on the you know, standing beside me there, but she's signing to the people. Here they are. The, you can see on the front row the deaf people. This is during the singing. And uh, there, you can see their hands. They're signing the songs as, as, uh, as we sing. Uh, had a good attendance there. Had a lot of people out of the country, actually, for you know, that, uh, that weren't there. Uh, these are some of the leaders there. Uh, if you remember Ryan talking about the meal that saved him, about 
about halfway or two thirds through the week. Uh, the man in the middle is the man that cooked all that grill stuff that, that uh, was so good. Uh, his name is Stefan Bobolescu. Uh, he's a, a good, strong member there. Uh, and then the men to the upper left, uh, they're both deaf, but they're both real excited to be Christians. They, they, uh, the, the older man uh, actually teaches. He can teach the deaf people. And uh, he's very knowledgeable. Then catty corner to that, in the bottom right, those two ladies are deaf. And uh, they are faithful members. They're there every service. Uh, the Bible, children's Bible study is going on on the, on the left-hand side there. And uh, you can see there's a lot of children in all the churches. And we don't get pictures of them much. We probably should, but uh, there's a lot of children, especially at, at uh, Valley. They have a, did have a, about 30 that came. It's down now to about 18, I think. But, uh, and then the young lady that I studied with, uh, Roberta is her name, and uh, she was baptized after the service there on Sunday at Batesh. And of course we had the baptism, we had to take off real quick and go to Skitu Golesh. And at Skitu, uh, that's where Titi was from. Uh, he was actually baptized earlier uh, from a personal study, uh, but he is at that church there and uh, had a real good service there. All total, I, I ended up doing four sermons, two Bible study classes. I did, uh, actually did 35 personal studies with 31 people, because some of the people I did more than one study with. I did three hours of counseling, and, and two of those hours were spent with a lady that's been out of the church for several years. And uh, she was a good worker, and her husband passed away, and, and uh, she ended up falling away. And, and I met with her and, and spent about two hours, and, and she had had a lot of problems in her life, and a lot of tears and prayer, and, and uh, she's back in church now. And I thought that was really good that, that we got her back. Uh, ended up visiting all the seven churches, had two hours of special class on Friday night. I directed two men's meetings, uh, we got a new cemetery at Corbin, and that's been a real problem because the Orthodox own all the cemeteries, and they won't let uh, our folks be buried in their cemetery, and they use it as a as a weapon. And so we now have a cemetery. Uh, it's not much; it it, it looks pretty rough. It's rough terrain that the land's on, but they have a a place now to be buried, and we already have two graves there. Uh, had two baptisms, and another lady who had been uh, confused uh, going to lots of different religions, and she finally uh, sat down and studied, and, and uh, she was baptized on Monday uh, as I was flying back. And of course, we had the one restoration, uh, so. It was a successful trip, and I was real pleased to be able to go over there and do that. It's a, it's a, it's a very tiring trip. It's something that uh, is physically demanding. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the three things that's needed for reaching the lost people. Um, there's a story about a little six-year-old boy who was uh, tried to listen. He, he tried to listen to sermons, and uh, he sort of struggled through one of the sermons. And after the sermon, he talked to his dad, and he said, "Dad, what does the preacher do the rest of the week?" 
And his dad said, son, he's a very busy man. He has to take care of his church business. He visits the sick. He studies the Bible. He has to take time to rest up. You see, preaching in public is not an easy job. And the little boy thought for a minute, and he said, listening's not real easy either. <laughs> and sometimes that's the way it is. Listening's not easy, especially if it's something that's challenging us. And so um, I, there's a couple things I want to look at. If you, you'll turn to Luke 15. And usually any time we mention Luke 15, uh, everybody thinks of the prodigal son. But I want to talk a little bit about the first two parables that are in that chapter. And for time's sake, I won't read all of it, but, but uh, in the first parable, it's the parable of the lost sheep. But it starts out uh, now the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to hear him. He's talking about Jesus. And you notice that the tax collectors and the sinners were coming to Jesus. They were drawn to him. And it wasn't because he was he was smoothing over sin that they were committing. And it wasn't because he had some uh, spectacular show that he was putting on, that uh, musical instruments and smoke and this sort of thing. They were drawn to him because they knew that he cared. You see, the first thing we've got to have for reaching the loss is compassion. We've got to care about them. Uh, the there's a lot of times a bad wrecks, and I can remember in my life really bad wrecks that I've come up on. And you know, when you, when you look at a wreck, uh, there's three kinds of people that are at that wreck. First of all, there's the, the bystanders and the onlookers. And the, those people stand back and they just watch. I don't know why they have the fascination of, of, but we tend to watch sad things. We seem to like sad things, sad movies. Uh, is there anybody here that didn't cry in Old Yeller? You know, we love sad movies. And, and I think that has something to do with it. But people are drawn to look on, on tragedy. And the second group of people that are there are the police officers. And the police officers are there to in investigate the cause and they're going to assign the blame, find out why that wreck happened and assign the blame to whoever it happened, whoever caused it. And then the third group is paramedics. And the paramedics don't care who caused it. All they care about is helping people. Uh, helping those people that are hurting and you know, everybody here, when we look at reaching the lost, everybody here is in one of those groups. Too many times we sit back and, and we just watch. We don't want to get involved. We're just onlookers. And then sometimes we want to be the police. We want to point at those people and we want to say, well, you know, it's your own fault. Uh, you should have been in church. All these bad things wouldn't be happening to you. Uh, but we don't go out and help them. You know, we have to become like the paramedics. We have to show compassion. And we have to reach out to those people and help them. We've got people out there all around us that are hurting. We don't have to go far before we see people that, that need God. They need Jesus in their life and so we have to decide which which person are we going to be are we going to be the one that's that's looking on are we going to be the one that's just criticizing or are we going to be the ones that are reaching out the second thing that we need for reaching the lost is effort if you'll notice 
uh, the shepherd in that that was looking for the sheep, he had to go out. He had to leave the 99 and go out and look for the one. And he, and he was concerned about it. We have to not use excuses that we got too much to do here. We have to go out and look for lost people. They're not going to... Sometimes we think they're, they're just going to wander in the church. But that's not the case. We need to be looking for those that are lost. We've all got friends and relatives and neighbors and co-workers that need to hear the word. And we need to be concerned about them. We need to put forth an effort. We need to think about things like How many of our prayers when we're praying are for the lost people? And how much are we of our preaching and our teaching are we doing that's directed at saving the lost? Are we teaching our young people that? Are we teaching them how important it is? We need to begin in the early ages. Now our young people here at Midway are on a mission trip right now. And they, they're doing, they're going. But I look around at other churches and I don't see a lot of things happening. Another, the third thing that we need to reach the loss is persistence. You know, the, the sheep that was lost, the shepherd looked till he found it. He didn't quit. Uh, the coin that was lost. Uh, anything that's valuable... We're going to look till, it's, till we find it when we have something of value. And we have to think about what's valuable to us. Are we making an effort to reach out because it's important to us? Do we, you know, there's a lot of people that we've uh, maybe talked to. Maybe we've given up on some of them, but, but through persistence, a lot of people can be saved. I've seen people that have been out of the church or involved in sin for years and years and come back. And it, it happens. We need to stay at it. Uh, there was a famous celloist, cellist uh, named Yo-Yo Ma. You may have heard of him. He's world-renowned. And he put on a performance in New York, and he was exhausted after the performance. It was a long performance. And after everything was closed up and it was time for him to go back, he, he got in the cab and he put his, his cello in the, in the trunk of the cab. And when he got to the, his hotel, he paid the driver, and as soon as the cab pulled away, he remembered the cello worth two and a half million dollars was in the back of the cab. And uh, so he started looking. And you know how many cabs there are in New York? <laughs> many, many thousands. But he didn't give up. He kept looking. And finally, the next night, he found the cello still in the back of the cab. You know, when we think something's valuable, we work at it. We keep on till, it's, till, it's, uh, till we find it. You know, the, the religious leaders in the first century, they were indifferent to the lost. They didn't reach out. They, in fact, they were antagonistic toward Jesus for, for reaching out to those people that were in sin. We don't need to just reach out to people who look like us and act like us and smell like us. We've got to reach out to the whole world when, when we were commanded to go into the whole world and teach the gospel. That means the folks next door. It means the folks all around. It means the folks over in Roma Romania. 
And we need to do everything that we can to do that. It may be that there's somebody here tonight that's lost. Maybe you've never had your sins washed away. I think as I look around, most of the people here have. But uh, there may be somebody who has drifted away. And there's things in your life that's standing between you and God. That's one of the things we, we talked about, that Isaiah talked about um, a wall that becomes between you and God, and it's that wall of sin. And if you've got sin in your life, you have hope because <coughs> James wrote, if we can confess our sins and pray to God, we'll, we'll be forgiven. If you've got sin in your life, you can do that now as we stand and sing.